This conference will were, now be recorded. I thought they were excellent. Um, the only thing I wish, I was viewing it from my phone and, and not my computer, because if I had my computer, I could have done some screenshots of, of Maha Hussein's uh, slides, and I would have liked to have taken more time to review them. So uh, when they asked for feedback, which I'm sure anyone who registered got a link to, to give them feedback, I did ask if they were, if it was recorded and if they were going to uh, have a rebroadcast or make it available. And uh, I haven't heard from them since, so I don't know. But uh, those are the only two I saw, and I thought they were good, very good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I believe they are going to record, or they did record it, Len. They usually do post it at a later date. Yeah. It takes them a while. Good. Because I, I signed up to get the, you know, the notification. Um, but so hopefully it'll, if, if and when it comes up and I find it, I'll post it for everybody. For everybody. Uh, Len, this is Mark Fenn. Uh, Len, this um, is Mark Fenn. Um, I know that somebody who watched it. I know that it, somebody who watched it. Wait a second, I'm getting an wait echo. Wait a second, here. I'm getting an echo. Yeah. Peter, Peter, yes, can you? Peter, oh, please. can you? Yes. Um, I watched, I had somebody who uh, was not participant, and I, I mentioned one of the presentations, and they said they went back and looked at it. So I think it's already posted on um, us too. Oh, interesting. Because I went, I went, I did go to look for it, and I couldn't find it yet. So um, I thought it should have been posted, but but it wasn't. It is posted. Uh, someone on my meeting last night gave us the site. I don't have it with me because I'm in the car, but it, it is. You can do, do a Google search, and you'll find it. Peter, okay. I, I tried that link that that guy gave us last night, and it just took you to a introductory screen. And it says sign up for for the video at a later date. It, it does not link to the actual video yet. Because I was on your call and I actually I'm the one that asked, and uh, the link he gave us did not work. Well, again, um, if people have problems uh, in the next week or so finding it, I will because I, I watched it uh, when it was live. Um, I can go back to my. Um, I just I just sent that link to my friend and they were able to get it, but maybe they've moved it somewhere. I just don't know. Okay. What did you think of the presentations, Mark? Um, well, I did not listen to the presentations in the morning because um, you know I'm <laughs> they're kind of things like diagnosis and treatment and um, initial treatments, and I'm sort of well beyond that. Um, but I did listen in the afternoon. Well, I guess right before lunch, I listened to a couple of those presentations. I listened to the presentation of Dr. Mahat about genomics um, a little bit. I guess I listened to the guy who talked a little bit about penis health and stuff, which I thought was well done. I thought in general it was informative. There were kind of a few little takeaways that I noted down that I'll follow up on later. Um, not a lot of big ahas for me. Um, uh, but I do know, for instance, I did send some information on about the one presentation about genomics and so on, and actually the Q&A session, um, because um, uh, Dr. Mahat, she was really, um, she was, wasn't very big on um, intermittent uh, ADT therapy. Right. Well, I think she was a little misleading on intermittent, to be honest, um, because her own research suggests <laughs> that um, if you are, placed on hormone therapy from the very outset, then intermittent hormone therapy is non-inferior. This was her seminal 2011 or 2012 paper. Right. But if you have recurrent disease and you go on intermittent, and you go on hormone therapy later, not as your part of your initial treatment, then it is inferior. And she didn't draw that distinction. Um, and, and it's an important distinction. And, you know, nobody pushed her on it. But if you look at her original paper, um, I'll try and uh, post it in the chat window. 
um, or at least a reference to where you can uh, find it. Then um, I sent it to, to Jim Ward um, <coughs> uh, earlier on in the week. Uh, you'll, um, you'll see that, that intermittent hormone therapy is considered to be non-inferior if you start on it from the very outset. Not only that, she didn't even discuss the uh, the the benefits of intermittent therapy, where you get a chance to rebuild your muscle strength, bone health, cognition. You know all those nice yeah. things that add up to good quality of life. Yeah, I I thought she was kind of dismissive, even though she is the She's the person that really first suggested through her research that it had value. I, I, I'm not sure I really got that, but Mark is right. I mean, that's the that was definitely the impression a lot of men would have come away with. Maybe she changed her mind. Um, Mark, would you mind? Would you be so kind as to post the that link that you know works in the chat box for everybody else? Well, I would, but I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'll check to see, because in my case, what I did is I just notified my friend and said I attended this, um, this, this session that was uh, uh, hosted by us too, sponsored by them in Northwestern, and he, and then he wrote back and said, and he says, oh yeah, I'm going to follow up on intermittent therapy because I noticed that the doctor said she wasn't really big on that, so I just assumed that he found it somewhere and was able to. Um, um, was able to then look at least at the Q and A piece at the end. So I'll ask him what link he used to get there. That's but I, I'm not sure if I'll get that response before we get off the phone. Right, we'll get it and we'll 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 we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put it out. Yeah, I'm um, sure a lot of people would like to see that. Okay, so I, I'm gonna I'm posting in the chat window right now. Um, A, send it to everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm posting a link to um, a, a study, um, intermittent androgen monotherapy is non-inferior to maximal androgen blockade. Now, I'm wondering if this is, this may not be her study. This, um, this may be a later study, but, but her study was the, was the same. No, this isn't her study. Let me see if I can find her study too, so that um, so that you guys you guys have that. Anyway, any anyone else want to say anything about the um, about the us two uh, presentation? I thought um, they were very I, compassionate I, and excellent. You know, I I I was. Uh, I was impressed by the quality of their uh, presentations and their compassion and dedication. I mean, I, I didn't feel that they were um, they were snobbish or you know doing the the doctor superiority thing. I thought they were um, really covering the bases and, and informative. Yeah, I agree with you, Peter. I think that was really good. I, I I think the most disappointing presentation of the lot was from the advocate, the patient advocate. I mean, he went rambling on about his treatment, which really wasn't very interesting. And he didn't say anything near enough about how he could um, guide him. I, I agree with you there. That was that was a low point for me, too. I listened to the whole thing. I got up at six in the morning to listen to it. Hey. Okay, so let me run down. Um, let me run down and see who would like some time today, and we can we can get into the meeting. So, Jake, since I put you on last, I'll ask you first. <clears throat> yeah, sorry about that. I was I was trying to see if I could find that webcast. Um, no, I don't have anything, Rick. Thank you. Okay. Um, Len, anything you'd like to talk about today? No, thanks, Rick. But I, I'm about to post a link in the chat box of a 2015 
article from JAMA Oncology uh, comparing IHT to continuous. And uh, once again, there they show uh, that it's non inferior. So right. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure where uh, Maha is getting her opinions from. Yeah. Um, thanks, Len. Um, okay. Um, Peter Monaco. Hello. We haven't heard from you for a few months. Good to hear you as always. Uh, anything, any, would you like some time tonight? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, speak for a few minutes, have a couple of questions. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Bordiga, you want to tell us how you're doing in your recovery? Yes, I would like to. Thank you. Um, uh, Peter, since you're in and out, is there anything you'd like to say and should we elevate you to the top of the list? Sure, I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, quick report on uh, self-advocacy and, uh, and, and my uh, trials yesterday lining up my scan. Okay. okay. Um, Mark Finn, would you like some time tonight? Need any time? I'll just listen. Okay, thank you. Um, Carl Foreman, would you like any time tonight? Uh, yes, just briefly. Okay. Um, Les, would you like some time tonight? Maybe just a couple seconds. Okay. And Les, you saw the um, you saw the response we got from Dell Jensen, correct? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure. Um, Paul Frieda, anything for you? No, nothing for me, thanks. Uh, Sylvester, anything for you? No, thank you. Um, Ken Anderson, anything for you? Yeah. No labs, yeah, no labs, so I don't really have anything yet. Okay. And Mr. Korea, anything that you'd like to say? No, Rick, thank you. I'm just, uh, I will be getting blood work tomorrow for my uh, three month check and a uh, little prion injection and so on the following week. Okay. Um, actually, there is something I do want to raise, and I'm going to raise it before we start. I, I, and it's an issue that, um, I think is frequent, but people don't talk about it. And Dennis was good enough to talk about it with me. And I just want to tell you, I want to comment on it. So Dennis and I spoke during the week because I was concerned and I hadn't heard from him for a while. And he's doing great, as he'll tell you himself. But um, needed to take a break um, for his own sanity. And um, I just want to say that is fine. And since we care about some of you guys a lot, because we feel like we know you, and I actually do know Dennis, because we live in the same area, um, and we don't hear from you, um, we're just concerned. We're not pushing you to show up on the meetings. And we really understand if you feel like you want to take a break. Um, and, um, you know, if you think of it, you can let me know. So at least I know you're doing fine, but you, 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 you need, um, you need a rest for a while. It's perfectly fine. Um, but I just want you to know that we, we kind of track you and somebody will say to me, one of my guys might say, Oh, I haven't heard from Dennis in a while. Where the heck is he? So, um, I, I just wanted to mention that, and I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Uh, the other thing is, if you feel like you need a break, come on the Speaking Freely call and talk about it on the Speaking Freely call. That's that's a great place to do it, because um, you'll get a lot of support, uh, and, it's, and it's the right forum for it. Not this is that this is the wrong forum, but that's exactly what that is for. So any, anybody want to say anything about that before we jump into the treatment issues?
Okay. All right. So, um, Peter, um, before we lose you, why don't you fill the guys in on your own situation and what you're doing? Uh, Are you getting feedback? Do you get feedback from me when I speak? A little. A little. Okay. I'll try, I'll try to lower the volume a little bit. I'm parked with the, with the air conditioning going. Um, okay, most, most of you, or a lot of you probably heard me at the end of last Monday's um, meeting where I uh, mentioned that I, I was monitoring my email during the meeting and my uh, blood test popped up and kind of surprised me that my uh, PSA, instead of creeping, took a jump. Um, and got my attention real fast. I think I mentioned it right at the end of the meeting. Anyway, so I spent some time that evening uh, last Monday, a week ago Monday, kind of going over um, what my options might be online. I emailed uh, UCSF to see if I still qualified for the Gallium 68 scan that I did a year and a half ago over there and so forth. Anyway, then I went to bed and woke up first thing in the morning, and sure enough, already there was an email from my doctor, uh, Turner in Los Angeles, kind of, because uh, he, he uh, as soon as he got my labs, he was on, on the case, and he told me what his thinking was, <clears throat> and he already got his staff working on uh, putting me in for a, a trial. He suggested the, uh, the 18... Uh, FPYL scan at Stanford, and I I did a search on on clinicaltrials.gov. I could not find that scan. It didn't. It would not pop up when I put the 18 PYL scan in there. Couldn't find it at all. And um, somehow he knew about it. He had the number. And when I plugged the number in, it, sure enough, it popped up. But they gave me the contact information and everything, and they. Uh, they had done the request already on Tuesday, gave me the name of the person to call, and I called them, and um, he answered right away, this guy at Stanford, and told me what else they needed. Um, unfortunately, I had all my records. They needed a copy of my surgery report from four years before, and I was able to, to uh, email that over to them right away. And then they needed a, a second um, PSA. They needed two PSAs over... 0 0.2 um, and I only had that one so I uh, set it up I, I called my oncologist set it up for another PSA on Friday of last week and not only did it come back it came back over what it was four days before on Monday so I, I knew something was going on I, was, I got a little bit upset about that um, so it jumped up another uh, two two tenths of a point from from four days before um and then i called up yes yesterday was veterans day yeah yesterday i had a fluke i thought that stanford would be closed but they were still open and, um and it was a hassle because they couldn't we tried four times trying to eat that he couldn't get the email i sent with my blood test and back and forth what was both of us on the phone and finally gave me his personal email and the damn thing went through um so he had it because so he wouldn't give me a date and uh, for a scan until I, he got it so finally you know and, and i wouldn't hang up until he got it so we went back i was i was kind of at wit's end yesterday but it finally went through and i got the date of um first he was going to give me the 20th of december I said, no, it's just too close to Christmas. That's stupid. So he relented and, and, and plugged me in on the 17th of December, which is still a month away. Um, but that's the best I could do. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a month out from doing the scan, uh, and I'll fly to Stanford, and then I'm going to go down to L.A. and, and talk turkey with uh, Dr. Turner and, um, and and see if I can get on top of this, find out what the best options are and so forth. But, um, you know, it just reinforces to me that, you know, we got to help each other and be our own advocates and whatever we got to do. I mean, I got a doctor who who's really goes to bat for me, but even, even in that situation, I still had to, you know, follow up and, and, and do some of the legwork and, and, you know, keep, keep the ball rolling there. 
and um and none of us can afford not to do that so um you know we I, we not only do I want to echo Rick's thoughts at the beginning there about Dennis you know we care about each other and we kind of care about ourselves and and do whatever it takes and and beat back the frustration level um cuz this can be a this can be a killer this can be a serious disease and we got to stay on top of it so that's where I am um I'm really thankful that I've got a doctor who's engaged and cares about me and is is on this and um because if it was just on my own, I don't think I'd, I'd be able to manage it. So that's that's just what I want to say. I've got nothing else to report. Um, Peter, I, I have a question for you. Maybe Len does too. Um, but um, I mean, obviously it makes sense to see um, if we can track down what is giving rise to this increase um but what are your thoughts on treatment and, and, and does it really make a difference what the scan is going to tell you and my concern is that you've got to wait it's going to be four to six weeks before you get into any sort of treatment if you make it dependent on the uh, 18F, DC, uh, 18F, DC, PYL scan. PYL scan. I, th th those thoughts go through my head for sure. Um, you know, I know if I start treatment right away, you know, I, the scans goes out the window. Uh, you know, I don't qualify for the trial. Um, I, I could do the, I can do an Aximan scan, but, um, I, I don't really trust the Aximan scan too much. I, I just, um, I, I, I'm not panicking. I'm, I feel this is the way to go. And, um, you know, we're talking, we're talking four weeks out, five weeks out. Uh, you know, and I would start treatment right away at, on the 19th. That's when my appointment is down in, 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 uh, in LA. Um, so you know, I'm only talking. I'm talking less than five weeks, and I think I can I can deal with that. Um, yeah, so, my point. Um, I'm, I'm I'm okay. That's that's where that's where I am with it. I, I trust that we're right. going to go. I will talk more with Dr. Turner. I you know bounce that thing off of them, that those thoughts off of them. But um, I, but I think I I'm okay. My, with my heart with it. I mean, if you go, if you're going to need systemic treatment. Um, it, the only benefit really of, of the <coughs> of the 18 FDC FPYL is to tell you where the Mets are, which is helpful. But at this point, since you've done one lot of focused treatment um, with the PBRT, I mean, don't you, it, it wouldn't more focus treatment be like whack-a-mole and aren't you are you thinking about systemic treatment whatever the result is yes i know that i know that's in the works i know that chemo's coming up i would just like to know whether the soft tissue i want to know if it's gone to the bone I would, i'd like to do the scan just to get an idea where things are and it, you know, get a, a picture of it at this point. I mean, I feel great. I feel strong. I feel healthy. I don't, you know, I, I don't feel any symptoms, but I know I'm not stupid. I know something's going on and I just like a, I want to get a picture of it right now and, okay. and see what I'm working with. And then I'm, I'm, I'm willing to start chemo, you know, a month from now if that's what's needed. Okay, or I mean, it could be a second, another second line antiandrogen. So we 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 don't know. It, it could and, be what whatever I got to do, I'm in the game. I'm 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 not I'm not stalling. I'm not burying my head in the sand, but I I um I right. feel like I'd like to get a better picture of what's going on because at this point I have not, you know, I have no evidence that it's gone to the bone. I have no evidence that it's in the soft tissue. I have no right. evidence of anything at this point. And, um, right. That's 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 why I'd like a picture, and I think I can, I can muscle my way through if they can get me in. You know, I told the guy if 
if he can get me in, if someone cancels or there's an opening before the 17th of December, I'll fly in overnight. I mean, I'll do whatever it takes. Oh, right, right. Um, don't forget to get a, techni a technetium scan because in the event that whatever shows up on the D 18F DCFP wire does not show up on the technetium, as Len will tell you, you may be able you may be eligible for darolutamide. Right. I'll, I'm gonna. I'm in touch with Dr. Turner on email, and I'll bounce that one through him, and, and he can. I can do that here easily enough. Okay. What's the cost of the um, of the Stanford um, trial? Zero. Okay. Just the cost. The cost. The cost of an airplane ticket and lodging. Okay. Okay. All right. Letting. What questions or thoughts do you have so, for, for so, either? Yeah, I like. I like to see someone do a do a search for the scan. See if you come up with it on on uh, on clinicaltrials.gov because I could not find it until I had the number, the MTT number. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, Peter and I spoke on the phone, and um, I, I echoed uh, the same advice you just gave Peter about getting the technetium scan under his belt just in case. Yeah. And uh, I know recently, Peter, you were talking about the, the uh, cognitive effects of ADT, and you seemed upset about that. So if you can... If you want to go with ADT again and you get darolutamide, I think you'll find uh, you won't be troubled by the cognitive uh, issues. Um, and I know you hit the gym frequently, so I, you know I think you'll even if you were on darolutamide, you'd still be able to, uh, for the most part, maintain your endurance and your and your muscle strength. Um, yeah, I, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I, my understanding is that chemo is more for high volume disease, which is highly unlikely in your case, and ADT might be more appropriate, but that's just my opinion. But uh, uh, also just, I know you said you're, it was a bit of a shock at first, just as it was for me when I found out I had bone lesions. Uh, nevertheless, you know that you're in uh, good care under uh, Turner, and so if he's okay with that uh, that scan being one month out, then I'm, uh, no reason why you shouldn't be fine with it also. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, but his, his, his email to me said ASAP, and he was a little shocked that they wouldn't give it to me before a month. So uh, if he uh, if he can go to bat and get it earlier, you know he might be able to do it. I don't know whether he can pull strings or not. Sometimes docs can do that. Peter, what what did you want us to look up for on the 18 FP1 and PYL? See if it, see if it shows up with a with a Stanford uh, trial. Oh. I couldn't find it. Okay, it, I did find it on clinical trials. Let me look and see if it's on, uh, if it mentions Stanford. I'll get back to you. Okay, this is Mark Finn. Um, yes. One, one question I had is that with getting the scan, how will that help you um, this, make a decision about what your next treatment is? I don't, I don't know if it'll help me make a decision. I think it just give me peace of mind to know, you know, where the action is. You know, is this still lymph action? Is it gone to the bone? Is it just, um, you know, it just kind of gives me, gives me an idea what's ahead of me. That's all. Um, you okay. know, how fast Thanks. this is moving, where where things are going. That's that's essentially it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else like to um, uh, have a question or a thought for Peter? 
Peter, I yep. found it. It does mention Stanford. I'll I will send you a link to your email. Okay. Oh, I've I've already printed it out. I I, I know it exists, but I couldn't find it when I searched the night before. Oh, that's that's good that you've got it. Okay, it's good. No, I don't, maybe I, I, maybe I, my I search was just weird. I don't find it either, either, Peter. So Jake's doing something right, and you and I are both doing something wrong. But I'm searching for okay. HMFTCFPYL, and I'm not finding, I'm not finding it on um, at all. So forget the you. F. Um, forget the F. Just I typed in 18 space PYL. Okay. And, uh, and the clinical trials was like number four or five on the hit list. Okay. It's okay. probably the F that's showing it off. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, um, we, Peter, um, you know, we wish you only strength and all the best with this and want to see you in treatment soon. Um, I kind of think the same way as Len, that if there was a lot of metastasis shown, then chemo might be right. If there wasn't much shown, then a second line antiandrogen might be right. Um, but, you know, that's just based on some of the current practices. Um, but we just want to see you in practice. We want to see you in, uh, in treatment sooner rather than later. So. Right, and then there's always the, um, I mean, the part of the discussion is going to be uh, the Keytruda question because, I, you know, I do oh, have yes. a genetic marker there. Yes, um, yes, yes, that went through my mind. I meant to bring it up with you. That's right. Yeah, and there are, tri there are trials for that. Uh, however, my, uh, the last genetic test I have from, uh, from Foundation One didn't indicate that my um whatever what's it called the msi or whatever it is wasn't MSI. high it was yeah. it was just medium so i don't know i, I mean i got too many questions in my head <laughs> yeah yeah i gotta I go wonder, back to medical school yeah i wonder if there's a way to um i wonder if there's a way to to test your msi again easily and that, that's the I question. Don't know. That's the question for Turner. Right. And then also that's might be a that might be a good reason to do the scan because if it shows up that there's a met that could be biopsied, that could help. Because right yeah. right now the biopsy is coming from uh yeah. from four year old uh tissue from my uh from my surgery. Right. Um so for those of you who don't no, um, and you may have picked this up on Saturday because they talked a little bit about MSI. MSI stands for microsatellite instability. And Len will correct me, um, please, if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that um, it basically is a measure of how unstable the um, the parts of the gene are and so they get scrambled how how unstable the at is it c and d is that right len what what, what oh, you're talking yeah you're talking about the nucleotides but that's getting too deep into the weeds basically uh, microsatellite instability means that uh as you did say the there's greater genomic instability and so what that does is creates more antigens, more targets for uh, therapies to seek and seek out and destroy. Like for instance, the uh, Keytruda pembrolizumab, that's an antibody and it goes after a particular antigen, PD-1, PD-L1, maybe some others. And so the more uh, genomic instability you have, the more cancerous uh, antigens, they're the proteins that say, hey, I'm a cancer cell, this protein doesn't really belong here. So the immune system can recognize it and uh, target it. And, and that's why um, 
uh, immune therapy is uh, is good for uh, people with MSI high. Okay, and that's why Len is that's why Len co moderates the call with me. That's why I get the big bucks, right, Rick? That's why. <laughs> that's why you get paid the big bucks, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Checks in the um, mail. Okay. All right. Yeah, Peter, don't forget to uh, hone in on uh, what 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 is the um is your mutation is it MLH one or MSH MSH six MSH six MSH six right yeah. okay MSH six okay and then, oh. then that brings that brings up one one more quick question because Len Len is in this league too. What effect does this does the uh, sonomic uh, mutation, the bracket sonomic meditation, have? Does that does that have any bearing at all? Because we both somatic? had that. You think about the bracket, somatic? the bracket mutation, the bracket somatic mutation. Does that have any bearing at all? Well, yeah. I mean, if you have that. That means you you may respond well to olaparib or any of the other PARP inhibitors, even if it's somatic and not not germline. Yes. Yeah. Better. Okay. In in a sense, it's okay. better better that you're somatic because you don't have as much exposure as people that are germline. Because it's only the, the drug is only acting on the cancer cells. Okay. Well, I seem I seem to be getting better seats at Yankee Stadium every minute here. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, let us let it let us know um, when you, when you get to um, to pitch level, will you? The field level. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, Peter Monaco, tell us what's Hi, up. You? What are you What are you thinking about? Oh, every time I attend these calls, I hear more stuff that confuses me. <laughs> I'm just like uh, I'm probably the least informed uh, cancer um, victim uh, out there. But uh, anyway, uh, just to recap my case, uh, diagnosed in 2014, uh, Gleason eight. Uh, three cores, uh, surgery January 50, uh, of 2015. That was followed by uh, six months of ADT and radiation, and that produced a four-year remission. And I recently had a recurrence, uh, so I'm back with Sloan Kettering. I had scans done, just CAT scans and bone scans. Uh, they were clear. Uh, and I went on this uh, trial that they're doing at Sloan Kettering uh, with regarding ADT. Um, I was put in the first arm, which is just something called Degarelix. I guess that's yeah. another name for Lupron, I would assume. And I yeah. had uh, I had two injections so far. Uh, the first injection did get my PSA uh, back down to zero, so that's where I'm at right now. And I've got uh, 11 more injections to go monthly. Okay. So that's where I'm at. Um, hopefully it'll stay down. Uh, but all these other things that you guys are talking about with these scans, you know, funny, the last time I was on the call, Rick, um, we were talking about, you know, my oncologist, uh, Dr. Han Shao, with um, uh, Sloan Kettering and Basking Ridge. And I mentioned to her, um, you know, this thing about the, was it the ax, Axerman or something? How do you pronounce that? Yeah, you got it. Okay. And, uh, you know, she was kind of like um, that we would proceed exactly as we're proceeding because, you know, my disease is systemic. She was satisfied with the CAT scans being clear and that wouldn't change anything. Uh, but I see, you know, I heard you use the phrase before, a focused treatment where I guess we look for possibly where uh, something caused my PSA to go from zero 
to 0.7 uh, back in August after a four year remission. So uh, it's somewhere, I guess. Uh, but I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm going on the uh, what you know, MSK is telling me. I, I have a comfort level with this uh, uh, person, Dr. Xiao. Uh, but I, 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 you know, when I talk, I hear you guys talk about all these other things that are possibilities that I should be doing. I get a little confused and thinking, am I doing enough? Is she doing enough? I, I don't know. So that's where I'm at. So I, I'm, I'm going to let Len talk to you exactly about that issue. But I, I do have one question. Um, and Len will explain to you there's a slight difference between Degarelix, which you're on, and Lupron. At this point, probably there's no difference, but there was a there was a slight difference when you first started taking it. But um, what are the other arms in the trial, Peter? Do you know? Well, there were three arms, um, and I got and it was a random selection. I, I there was Degarelix. There was the second arm was Degarelix with apalutamide the third arm was the garlic apalutamide and a baritone acetate with uh, with with pregnizone as okay. well okay so the, um let len will told you but i just want to say to you that you you may as well not be in any trial so what they what you're getting is the least at the lowest level of treatment um, and there might be um, there might that there are docs that might treat you more aggressively but Len why, why don't you why don't you speak to explain to to um, Peter what why scans may be necessary and what the treatment options might be for somebody whose disease first recurs? Uh, well, as Peter, the other Peter, Kafka, uh, mentioned, it's often very helpful to know exactly where the, the recurrence is. So, it's good to know if it's only in the bones, if it's only in the lymph nodes, if it's only in soft tissue, because there are different treatments that target each of those. Um, and uh, in your case, you're getting androgen deprivation therapy, which is a systemic therapy. So it'll, it'll affect every uh, type of um, spread of the cancer. Um, now, Degarelex, uh, as Rick said, is a bit different than Lupron uh, without getting, again, without getting too technical on that. Um, Degarelex has been found to uh, keep the uh, testosterone levels down better than Lupron does. And it's, it's reported to be uh, less, uh, there's less cardiotoxicity to Degarelex than there is to Lupron. Now, if you don't have any pre-existing uh, cardiovascular issues, maybe it doesn't make any difference. Um, I was on Degarelex for quite a long time, and um, I just got tired of those gut shots and the swelling and redness uh, reactions that I got, uh, topical reactions that I got from the injections. I'm um, just wondering, how are you faring with that? Or ha how many injections have you had so far? I've had uh, two in total. Um, and uh, I did get, uh, you know, a slight reaction. I'd call it slight at the at the topical level. You know, a little achy for about two days. Saw a little redness there. I felt a little bump at the injection point. But then it goes down after a couple of days. Right. So I, I, it's nothing okay. that I would consider, you know, a big concern unless it gets worse with the, you know, additional shots as they as I keep going. Yeah. Well, in my case, it did uh, after maybe maybe a dozen or so injections. Uh, I'd occasionally uh, feel like I had the flu for a day, 
the day after I got the injection. Okay. Uh, I got. I have to take this call, guys. I'm just going to go on mute. Yeah. And Len, uh, to add, this is Mark Finn. To add what the Len said is, I was on initially on Trellstar, then I moved to Lupron, and then now I'm back on Trellstar. I just found that Trellstar um, was very effective in reducing my testosterone. And I just felt a lot better than it. I was not feeling bad with Lupron, but just a little bit more hot flashes, a little bit more fatigue. And so, um, and I actually have a, a friend who I suggested he discuss that with his doctor and he went on trial star and has found he can tolerate it a lot better. Um, the other thing is I know you're in a clinical study, so that, that sort of, you know, sets the schedule when you have to get this, but I know with trial star and Lupron, um, if you're on ADT, you're probably gonna be on it for a while, if not forever. And um, you can, with trial star at least, you can get you can get uh, six month injections. It's not something you have to go in every month and get. So right. um, I'm not sure if, uh, and Rick can comment on this. I'm not sure if Degarelix, because I've never gotten, uh, necessitates a monthly injection. But um, trial star and Lupron do give you that six month option, which um, I find right. convenient. So, and, and if you have side effects from the initial injection, um, then obviously you, have, you would only have to go through the side effects once versus every month. Right. Yeah, um, the the Mark is absolutely right. Um, see if I can explain this in um, the simplest way. Um, the drug that you're on, Peter, is what's called an LHRH drug. Um, Luteinizing hormone, I forget what the R and the H stand for, but essentially what it does is it shuts off the production of testosterone um, from your testes. Right. It does it in a slightly different way to Trailstar and Lupron and Zolodex and the other drugs, and it may be slightly more effective um, and have slightly less side effects, but it's marginal. And it's really? probably the best of all the drugs, but it's only administered monthly. The other okay. drugs can be ministered for, um, administered for a longer period of time, although when they're administered for too long, like six months, we've known situations where they were not as effective as when they were administered for shorter periods of time. When I did the drug, I was on a 90 day shot. Right. Now, the point here is that you pulled, in some senses, you pulled the short straw because you got the very basic treatment that you would have gotten if you would have gone into a community oncologist. Right, right. You didn't get any of the fancier drugs. And those fancier drugs may not have been available to you anyway if you were outside the trial. Because the approval, you may not be in the approval line for them. Okay. On the other hand, um, you may be eligible for those drugs and you may be able to get them, but we don't know because we don't, we, you haven't done any scans and we don't know exactly where your disease is. Well, I, I mean, I did have, have CAT scans and bone scans recently, which were clear, but I guess from what I'm hearing from you guys, those are not deep enough anymore that, you know, is... They're not detailed enough. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the irony is that in the, in the drug that Len is taking right now, his metastasis doesn't show up on the basic scans, but it shows up on the very detailed scans. And the fact that it doesn't show up on the basic scans makes him eligible for a very good drug. <laughs> right. I see. You right. know, and, and because it, that drug was approved with the very basic scan, but we, we don't have as much information as, uh, as, as we would like. I mean, I, I, I know that you had, I, I, I know, yes, uh, from my notes, I see you had seminal vesicle invasion and, and 
there was a pelvic node that that right. that was cont contaminated. Right. Um, and we know you had the radiation, the pelvic girdle radiation back in 15. So despite all of that, your disease has, has, has improved. And I think if it were me and, and the other guys will chime in, I would want to get, well, I wouldn't be dismissive of these fancier scans. And yeah. especially at MSKCC, you know, I, I get very worried that some of these doctors are more interested in pushing you into a trial than they are in treating you the right way. And and MSKCC does have, or did have, I don't know if it's still open, did have the fancier scan. And um, it would be very, we, we were talking about the 18 FDCSF, DCFPYL. I mean, that was available, I believe, at one point. Len knows this better than I do, but I think it was available at, at MSKCC, but Len couldn't get in and finished up going and getting the scan down at NIH. But there are fancier scans, and I would want to know where that disease is right now, because I would want to know whether I should be adding anything to um, the LHRH drug alone. Right. And there's no reason for you to be in the trial alone because um, you're only getting the basic treatment that you get anyway. There's no advantage but to standard you. Care. You, you can standard walk care. out of that trial anytime. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't get it. I mean it's it's a random selection. And I was like kind of oh, okay when they told me I was in arm one. All right. I mean uh, but it made me wonder, gee, is this the best thing for me? Uh, you know, yeah. uh, as you said, I, you know, it, after all of what I went through in 2015, it still came back four years later. So something's wrong right. somewhere. Well, this is Mark Finn again. And, and Rick and Jake, I think you probably could comment on this. So I'll see if I'm correct. Is The other thing is, is what is your age, please? I'm 68. Okay, 68. Um, the reason being is that... Uh, one of the things to consider would be a uh, PET-18 scan, which would be much more specific for um, prostate cancer and give you a better idea. Uh, my own case is that, and the reason I ask your age is it's something which typically when you get over 65, Medicare will pay a significantly bigger portion, which means that therefore Medicare, you can go through it um, versus if you did it before 65, um, uh, your insurer most likely will uh, it's changed a little bit today, but they'll consider it to be an experimental scan. Um, but in my case, I had like four, five, six metastases. But after I got the PET scan, it was a PET 18 scan. It was clear mm -hmm. that it was like I had two lesions, not four or five. And so therefore, we could focus on what we need to do about those uh, uh, several lesions. And so, and it also gave you an idea of the kind of treatment that you could you know, I mean, in some ways, I'm still on systemic treatment uh, from, you know, Trellstar and then now Zytiga, but um, at least it gave a way in which you have a better idea of where it's at. Now, at the same time, I know some people from some other networks I'm involved with who have pretty high PSAs, and yet they are not able to identify a specific um, metastatic disease, or they can't decide the specific source of that disease. So it kind of depends person to person. So. Well, I, I guess Rick and Jake. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rick and Jake. Does that make sense? Is that correct? Correct me where I'm wrong on that. Yeah. No. I mean, I think by and large, yes. I mean, you definitely are eligible for the Axiomin scan, and it's covered by um, it's it, it's it's definitely covered by uh, Medicare. Yeah. Um, and there are more advanced scans which are. Uh, may be available to you which are better than the axiomin scan and the question is whether you would want to whether you want to do them i mean that 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 that's the issue um i mean do, who else would like to comment on whether it's worthwhile getting additional scans at this point peter um what was your P, what's your psa right now it's uh, zero at the moment, thankfully, after well, one shot. 
my comment is that none of these scans, Axamin, PYL, Galamp 68, none of them is probably going to be of any benefit with a PSA that low. I agree. This is my friend. You know, and, that, and that's probably why your doctor's not considering it uh, or considering any of them because, you know, it's a, at the very minimum, you have to have a point too. Yeah, but, but, but hold on, Jake. Um, Peter's, Peter's PSA was 0.97 before he went on. Yeah, it was uh, actually worse than that, Rick. You know, when I relapsed in August, it went from zero after four years to 0.8. Within six weeks, it was up to 1.4. Okay. Then I had, which is huge, I mean, uh, from what I'm used to seeing. And then I had my first injection uh, in uh, September. And then when I got my first PSA test a couple of weeks later, it had gone to zero after that first injection. Uh, so I, that's why I'm at zero now, but it was jumping up like crazy. Okay, well, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> Right. So I think that I think that if you've got anything there, um, now is the time to get scanned before um, before the I mean, the Lupron may reduce it for a while. Yeah. But ultimately, the Lupron isn't going to work. And the problem is, the longer you stay on the Lupron, the less likely you're going to see anything on the Axiomen scan. And I, I don't know enough. And this is a question you'd have to ask. How long? You have to be on the Lupron um, for these lesions not to show up anymore, because yeah. sometimes they don't. Sometimes the Lupron works. Do, does anybody have any input on that? Rick, this is Mark Finn. I don't have any more input on that, but I have to run. So um, good luck with the rest of your discussions, and I'll try again to be in on the phone call. Oh, Mark, call. I'm sorry. You, do yeah, you yeah, have Rick. Rick, can I make a comment? This is Peter, the other Peter. Yeah, just, Peter, just hold on a minute. Just hold on one minute. Mark, okay. do let me know if you've got a time constraint, because we'll, you know, we'll move you along. I didn't no, realize. No, I, I didn't, no, no, I didn't have any input really to today. Oh, okay. I was hoping to be able, I was hoping okay. to give you some, some uh, information because I'm on this low dose regime for Zytiga, but I really don't have much to report on that yet, so I will report it when we next chat. So, no, there's soon. no problem, Rick. Come back soon. Peter, thank go you, ahead. Thank you for your okay. comment. I, I tried to make a comment earlier, but I think my thing was gone. So, your disease, Peter, is, is very similar to mine. I had seminal vesicle invasion. I had surgery in 2015 and so forth, and I made it two years before mm -hmm. recurrence. I think, I think my take, I agree with Rick. I think you have a very conservative doctor. I think you should get a second opinion if it was me, um, because I think scans can be, at this point can be very helpful. And my take on it is I think you actually drew the, the, uh, the good straw, because the fact that you're on Degarelix means that you could go off of this and recover very quickly and be eligible for a scan. Whereas if you were on a three-month Lupron shot or a six-month Lupron shot, you'd, you'd never be able to qualify for the scan. So I think I think you should get another opinion from a, doc, a doctor who's a little more aggressive in this. And I bet you you could get into a Gallium 68 scan someplace on trial and really find out what you're, do, what you're working with and whether it's treatable as oligometastatic. Okay, that's a great idea. So I, I, I've been talking to other friends and family and uh, you know, they share that opinion because you know, I've been telling them about the information I'm picking up on this call and they're saying, well, why would MSK of all places be so conservative? They're supposed to be leading edge. Uh, you know, you think you're dealing with, you know, a, a place that's going to pull out all stops and yet I do get the feeling that this doctor is being rather conservative. Yeah. Uh, Len, you want to comment on that? Who is the oncologist at MSK? Her name is Han Xiao. She's uh, she's Chinese. It's X I A O, and you know she's a big shot there. She works both in Basking Ridge and New York. She's a vice chair. I mean they they, they hand out that title a lot. I see, but she's like head of operations or something and. 
I, I don't know. I mean, she seems like a brilliant woman to me, frankly, uh, when I speak to her. Uh, she's got all the answers. Uh, and I did ask her that one about the Aximan scan. And she said, even if it did pick something up, we were going to proceed exactly the same as we're proceeding right now. That was her response. And, and she seemed satisfied with the CAT scans that were done by MSK in Basking Ridge. So you are in a clinical trial and you're getting yes. daguerreolics. Yes, I got. I drew on yeah. one, which is right. daguerreolics only. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> my comments on that would be the following. It's already been <clears throat> proven that if you take a first-line LHRH drug, either Lupron or daguerreolix, plus um, a second line antiandrogen, like the ones in the trial, apalutamide and abiraterone, mm -hmm. the other two arms. It's been shown that you have a longer progression free survival with the combination. However, what isn't clear is what if you started off with just a single agent and then didn't add in the second agent until you became castrate resistant. You know, then how would the progression free survival curves appear? Right. So, I mean, I, I think I understand that's probably, that might be one of the reasons why they're doing this trial. I can't understand any other reason why they might, because we already know that adding a second line antiandrogen uh, improves uh, progression free survival, but it's something you should talk to your oncologist about. Ask her, like, what, why should I be oh, in this yeah. trial getting to Garelix? Well, I think, I think that the, the arm that he's in is basically the, the control group compared to yeah. abiraterone and, and, I mean, to apalutamide and abiraterone are the other two arms. So he's just basically the control group. Standard of care, yeah. Right. Um, uh, I just wanted to add myself because uh, when I originally was looking for my own oncologist, Dr. Zhao was actually one of the uh, people that I met with in Baskin Ridge, as well as um, Charles Drake's office in Columbia Presbyterian and uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, Dr. O's department, although I didn't meet with him directly, and also I ultimately ended up at the Rutgers Cancer Institute. When I met with Dr. Zhao, um, my initial reaction was, and I had talked about this previously, where they're very, um, I have to say, they're very regimented, and, and I found them to be narrowly focused, at least for me, in my opinion, and that it's difficult to get a second opinion. As, as Rick had recommended to me, there was a, another doctor, the, the woman's name escapes me, and I had said, I'd like to get a second opinion. They said, oh, no, Dr. Zhao can answer all of your questions. You can have a second opinion. I said, thank you, and I did not stay with, uh, did not continue with, with Sloan Kettering. So, um, you know, I don't know if you looked at any other uh, centers, uh, major cancer centers, because it sounds like you're in New Jersey like I am, and uh, we have a wealth of, of options. Um, I was on Firmagon, the Garalex, my very first month when my uh, PSA shut up uh, very quickly with a matter of six weeks from five to 20. And uh, my urologist at the time had said, well, let's go do Firmagon at least for the first month. Uh, it, it's about controlling the flare. And uh, after I had the Firmagon just for that 30 uh, days, then I went on to the Lupron and, and or equivalent. Uh, again, in my situation, as I've discussed here before, I also had genetic testing, so I know that I'm BRCA2 positive. So I was able to target <clears throat> my treatment specifically. I was also in a clinical trial, or I guess technically I still am, out of the Rutgers Cancer Institute that had two arms. One was standard of care only, and the other was standard of care plus a robotic prostatectomy. And I was hemming and whoring. Um, uh, I found out that I was randomized into the uh, mm -hmm. surgery part of it, and I felt a little more comfortable to have that as an option as opposed to standard of care, which means, you know, what, what's it mean, standard of care? 
but um, I, I did have the uh, operation, and uh, but I don't want to go into any greater detail than that. Just to say, oh, oh, can we? Can we just? I, I just want to sort of stay right, right on focus with Peter, and we will come to you. But Peter, um, I think there's that there is certainly good reason to get a second opinion. Um, I know that Len wasn't happy with his oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, he didn't feel that he was getting the best possible treatment and he switched. Um, it is difficult to switch between oncologists. Dana Radcock was the name that Carl was, seek, was, was, was looking for. Um, we know she's pretty good. We, we like her a lot. We do refer to her. But I think it's the luck of the draw that you get the right oncologist in the first place at Memorial Sloan Kettering, because if you don't, you've had it. You, it's really hard to switch. Yeah. And I think what we said to you before um, is that one person that you might want to, to check out is Len's new uh, Janito Urinary Medical Oncologist at Mount Sinai, Dr. O, who gets very high marks from everybody who goes to to see him so um i think if it were a second opinion um i was looking for in your situation i'd probably be be going to see dr o doctor and he's with he's with which one again which kind of hospital not sinai, not sinai. Yeah, I, I thank you all for uh, this uh, feedback, uh, Carl. Thank you very much. Um, I, I get it when you say, you know, Doctor Shao seems uh, a little inflexible. I, I, that's what I've gathered just from the couple of meetings I've had with her. Um, so, um, how just uh, what can I expect? You know, now that. Uh, I had one injection and the PSA went down. Do you think it's going to stay down or is it going to be uh, the, the a ride going up and down going forward? What, what do you think? I'm going to be on it. For, if I stay in this, I'll be on it. I have another 11 injections to go. What is the Let, probability or the likelihood of what, what's going to happen? Anybody have any ideas? Well, I, I would say the likelihood is that um, you will remain undetectable for one okay. year. Yeah, I think I think uh, Degarelex will do a good job for you. And then as soon as you go off it, it goes right up. Uh, most of the time, yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's true of any ADT drug. Right. N none of them work forever. Right. <clears throat> but if you go off of it, long, if you go off of it for a short time and do the scan, you can go back on it. You just can't be on it to do a scan trial. Right. And that's the whole concept of the intermittent ADT. Correct. You want to take a break, you go back on it, and hopefully it works another time. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we need to move along. Um, Peter, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need help in the interim. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Bob Bordiga, how are you doing in your recovery from your surgery? Well, thank you for asking. Pretty good, I think. Uh, it's been two weeks since my prostatectomy. Um, last Wednesday, I went and had the catheter removed. That was a big relief, I tell you. <laughs> um, I also had a couple blood tests. Uh, they found my uh, PSA at... Uh, less than 0.1, although it doesn't necessarily mean anything yet, because my testosterone is still being affected by the Lupron shot four months ago and uh, went from 14 uh, before surgery up to 29. So um, according to uh, my, uh, uh, my urologist, uh, 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 when the testosterone is uh, above 150, then the uh, PSA test uh, becomes more accurate. Is that what you uh, understand as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so when, there was, was, when was your yeah, last, when was your last uh, Lupron shot? Uh, 
Four months ago, exactly. And it was a 90 day shot or a 120? 90 day, 90 day. 90 day. So, you know. But I still have hot flashes, so it's gotta be still working on me. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it might be worth letting it wear off and seeing your PSA come, your testosterone come back up so you get a real reading. Of right, that's what I'm planning to do. That's what I'm planning yeah. to do. But um, I, uh, I I did some more some research. I was reading uh, 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 Dr. Patrick uh, Walsh's book, Surviving Prostate Cancer, um, and he said that uh, in the book it says if you have positive lymph nodes after a prostatectomy, and I have one uh, positive lymph node, um, then um, he recommends an ultra sensitive PSA which measures it in the thousands as opposed to the tenths. Um, and uh, they said in the book, it says they, the study showed that if at that point um, your uh, ultra sensitive PSA is under 0 0.003, then 14% uh, uh, of folks would have uh, uh, an elevated PSA in 10 years and the rest would not. But if it was above, 0 0.003, 78% would have it. So I thought that might be worth uh, finding out if I can get an ultra-sensitive PSA. Well, the, the, the answer is you can at Kaiser, you've got to ask for it, but I'd like, Peter, are you still, yeah, you're still with us. Peter, this is right in your bailiwick. These are, this is often a, a topic that comes up in your, on your uh, call, on your, in your group. Would you, would you like to respond to, to, to uh, Bob? Yes, I I do an ultra sensitive. If you've had a if you've had surgery, just do ultra sensitive PSAs anyway. I do it to the hundredth, uh, and I do it regularly. I, my my thought was, did they do a um, a decipher test or any of the other basic genetic tests on you uh, to give you an idea where you stand in terms of recurrence? That would probably give you a better idea than than, than uh, these numbers on a PSA test. Um, I'm not familiar with that test that you mentioned, but uh, I did do a, uh, uh, in terms of genetic stuff, I did that, the, the color test and uh, now this indicated. Would, talk, talk, talk to your surgeon. There's, there's several tests that give you, um, one's called Decipher, which I did, and it tells you what, what the what the percentage of possible recurrence might be, and if you've had a if you had a positive lymph node, I mean, it, it'll look at your um, your pathology and compare it with other people in similar situations, and kind of give you an idea what you're looking at going forward. It's not definitive, but it puts you in a percentile that uh, can be helpful. Right, and, uh, and how is that test done? Is it a blood test? Is it a what is kind of test? Is no, it? They'll, they'll, use, they'll use the tumor tissue from your from your uh, from your pathology. Oh, I see. All right, because um, he he did tell me that he thought I had a uh, a thirty five percent chance of uh, not having a recurrence, but a sixty five percent chance of uh, 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 of having a recurrence uh, after surgery. Okay, well, maybe, so I don't know. maybe he's already. Maybe he's already done the test then, or I don't think he's just pulling numbers out of the air. He, he must no. be basing it on something. So he I don't may, know. He may, he may have, but I'll ask him about that. I'll and and Peter is Kaiser, so I don't know how easy it is to be able to get those tests. So, you know, I think, I think that, um, uh, Bob, you should be um, finding out what uh, is his basis for the recurrence? Uh, yeah, he may okay. run the post surgery. There is a nomogram, a post surgical nomogram. Um, from M M Memorial Sloan Kettering has one, and he may have run that, and he may be pulling it from that. Um, you know, the big issue is will it change your treatment? Um, prognosis and I think as you said you're probably going to do more hormone therapy and you're probably going to do salvage radiation so to give yourself the best shot 
Um, and I think if that's what you're going to do, and if, if you feel that's the way to go, then it doesn't matter. You know, the tests aren't going to change your treatment prognosis. Yeah, I mean, understood. I've already contacted my uh, radiation oncologist that I had uh, spoken to extensively before I made the decision between uh, right. treatments. And uh, I'm trying to get a, a, a conference with him. Um, and that'll probably happen soon, I hope. Um, I just I want to tell you a couple of other things real quick, if, if I can. Uh, yeah, you, uh, um, sure. Let me, ju let me just give you a co uh, a co another comment, which is that sure. a recent study that came out that said that if you um, defer the actual radiation, if you go on the hormone therapy, but you defer the adjuvant early salvage radiation for several months, the, the, it, it, it doesn't have an adverse effect. Right. So yeah, and I also read something else where a uh, six-month uh, period for doing that was a uh, was uh, was ideal. Right. Right. Um, right. Um, I mean, I've also read that if you have lymph node involvement, that in ten years the likelihood of having undetectable PSA is like one percent. You know. Yeah. So that doesn't sound too uh, too too promising either. Uh, right. Um, but anyway, I, I thought I would uh, let you know uh, about uh, the good news, which yes. is that after the uh, uh, catheter came out, um, I started peeing like a 20-year-old. Um, I got an incredible flow now that I haven't had in 40 years. And um, right now, uh, I'm using like one pad every two days. So I think I'm coming along really well in the continence uh, arena. So I'm very happy about That's that. Great. And I Great lost news. eight pounds. Yeah. I oh lost eight God. pounds. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, fringe that benefits, you know? That must have been a they took out. Huh? That must have been a pretty big prostate they took out. It, it was big, but but uh, I think my wife's been giving me smaller portions of food, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's in the other room. Um, but, you know, you know I'll, I'll take what I can get, you know? Um, so. You know, we Peter is much more familiar with with the issues around post surgical recovery than we are on this call because he deals with it a lot more often. Uh -huh. um, but um, Peter, it sounds one pad every two days. Does that sounds good to you? That sounds great. Keep keep doing your exercises, your Kegel exercises, and you'll you'll be fine. Yeah. yeah, I am, and I've got a physical therapy appointment uh, in a week. Yeah, it sounds like you had a great. Sur it sounds like you had a great surgeon. To, I think uh, I did, Doctor Finley. To do that, yeah, at, yeah. at Kaiser to, Sunset yeah. in L.A. Yeah. yeah. Excellent, and 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 as well as on this call, because we'll help you with the hormone therapy, we'll help you with the additional radiation. But you might want to consider joining Peter's call, which is on the second and fourth Mondays. Um, right, because those guys are going to have a lot more experience um, and and be able to talk to you. If, God forbid you have any more issues. All right, I, were, they, uh, were they able to spare your nerves? Did you have nerve sparing surgery, or did they waste? Them? Yeah, one one of them was spared. Okay, well, that's going to be tricky. You might want to. Where where are you located? What part of the country? Um, in California, uh, Southern California, in Culver City. Uh, in the LA area. Yeah, you might want to you might want to make an appointment with Dr. Gary Leach down at Tower Urology, and and see if you can talk to one of their uh their sexual function people there. Oh, because, I'm uh, not worried about I'm not worried about that. Um, uh, that's behind me at this point in life. Um, I know, I'm fine too, with that. But but you might but you might be able to spare your penile length. I mean, there's things you can do to try to to keep from losing everything. I mean there might be some might be some some therapeutic stuff you can do and it might be worth talking to them if you if it's possible. But you're in Kaiser you said, right? Right. So maybe yes, that I doesn't am. work. Yeah. Yeah. So it yeah. probably wouldn't work anyway. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm 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 not gonna that's not the least of my worries as we say. I, I know but but if but it does things atrophy and you'll start getting shrinkage and so forth. 
and, and, uh-huh. the, and the anatomy will well, change. Well, I am, I am, I am taking uh, solidinfil right now for you know to keep it right. the blood flowing over there. So I'm doing All right, but you might want to you might want to do manual stimulation even if you're not going to get an erection, just to try to keep it's, it's the pill the pill alone is not going to do the blood work. You might have right. to just manually stimulate yourself just to keep in the game, even though you're not going to gain regain sexual function. Yeah, well, I'm certainly not interested right now. But uh, I guess oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> okay. Well, Peter, when you when you next go to see uh, Dr. Turner, um, maybe you and um, Bob can have uh, lunch together. Sure, I'd love to. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I'll let Peter. You let me know, and I'll connect you with Bob. Yeah, I'll be down there around the 18th or 19th. Of December. Oh, that's right. Okay, I'll. I'll All right. I'll, yeah, I should be. I should be uh, driving around by then. Okay. okay. I'll, right. I'll send you guys uh, contact details. All right. Let's uh, let's go to Les and then um, finish up with Carl Foreman. Les, what's on your mind today? Uh, well, not a great deal. I was just uh, comment. You know, I came back. I was in uh, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, when they had you had the session last week, and things came out okay, uh, nothing drastic. Uh, uh, PSA was still 0.1. Uh, the uh, testosterone has gone up a little bit, up to 257. But other than that, uh, things are, I guess, stable. What did um, Dr. Kwan have to say about doing these C11s at such a low level of PSA? Well, I think his philosophy is that uh, with a Gleason 10, that you can uh, have uh, cancer without it producing uh, PSA. So he wants to keep tabs on it on occasion. Uh, we did talk about the next time uh, he had tentatively set it up for six months from now to do it again and you know I quizzed him about it and he said well if I told him that I uh, get the PSA tested locally every six weeks so we, we discussed it a little bit and he said well if your PSA PSA is not going up, getting closer to the six months, you know, give us a call and we'll postpone it. Okay. Um, Len or anybody else, did, would you like to um, dialogue at all with, 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 um, with Les? Um. Les, I, I heard, I'm, I'm sorry, I was typing in the chat box, so I was a little distracted, but uh, I heard you say your PSA is 0 0.1? Uh, yes. And your T levels are around 250-ish? Yep, 257. And then, yeah, and I heard, and Rick asked you about uh, what did uh, Quan think about this scanning with such a low PSA, and, and, and but I didn't hear the response to that, sorry. Well, I think his philosophy is with the Gleason 10, since you may with Gleason 10 uh, be getting a spread of cancer without uh, showing uh, the PSA, that he wants to check it periodically anyway. Okay, so he, he's thinking, with the Gleason 10, at any time, your cancer could morph into something that doesn't produce PSA or PSMA, for instance. Right, right. Yeah, okay. Well, I would also, if you haven't already, I would also ask him, is there any uh, limit to just how many of these choline scans you can get without having to worry about secondary cancers from, you know, from all the radiation. I did inquire about that about a year ago and he kind of skirted the issue that I was like, well, I haven't heard of anything uh, specific. 
So I, I was a little bit disappointed in the answer, but he didn't uh, indicate that there was any definitive uh, information about uh, doing some potential damage. Since they're the only ones in the country that are, as far as I know, that are using that scan, it seems to me they should be tracking everyone just to keep an eye on on any possible long longer term side effects. But yeah, they are uh, working on the PSMA scan there, but it sounds like it's going to be several months out yet. Yeah, I mean, is that right? Ahead. They're the only ones using C11. I mean, I know UCSF at one point had, was using C11, but um, oh, okay, I wasn't aware of that. I I thought Quan was the only one. No, no, they were um, um, Dr. K. Um, Kahanowitz was uh, was using a C11. I think I had a C11 with him years ago. But um, I, I thought there were other people using it, but but maybe I'm wrong. And uh, what's his name? Was Almeida was using it, but he shut down. Yeah, um, I don't know if there's any difference between C11 acetate, like Almeida was using, or C11 choline, like uh, Quan uses. Right. I'm not okay. sure. No, there is. But, okay. I think I had a C11 choline with with Karnowitz back in 2007. Um, but anyway, um, sorry, you, somebody, you, had a, you were going to ask um, Les something else, I think. Uh, no, I think that was about it. Oh, um, Les, I have a question for oh, you. Oh, Suzanne calling. Um, I, I have a I'm question for so you. Let me just uh, uh, tell you let's all right just back. Mr. Bordiga there. Um, uh, oh, wait. Did somebody get in? I got it. Right, right, right. Um, did uh, how are you doing with your Notoria? Have you have you spoken to anybody about taking a drug that will help you get more sleep during the night? No, I haven't. Uh, I've been a real a little bit of reluctance to do that since I have to get up and go to the restroom about every hour and 15 minutes. I don't want to sleep through it. Yeah, but I mean, it should, you know, these drugs that they give you should make you not get up every hour and 15 minutes. Oh, so, okay. I mean, that's the point. It's not that you're going to sleep through it. We're not talking about a sleeping drug. We're talking about oh, okay. a drug that will that will work on your bladder so that you don't have to get up so often. Uh, yes, I had talked to one doctor about that, and I was a little bit reluctant. I'm taking in so many drugs now, I was reluctant to add to the collection. OK. Uh, okay. I, I'm still open. You know, I suppose that would be a possibility, but. Well, yeah, it's up to you, but there are drugs out there that should be able to help you. Did you have any recommendations on that? Um, yeah. Um, guys, you, I, I've got to look them up. Who knows some of these drugs off the top of the... Well, uh, Flomax. Right. Generic name, Tamsulosin. Made by uh, my friend company. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, but I don't have any stock in the company. I'm not plugging anything. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, there's um, wh which is the, the, the there's a new one that's supposed to be really good, but it's um, expensive. Jake, you usually remember the name of that drug. Do you do you remember? Oh, what is that the one called? Jim Jim uh, was taking in New Jersey? Mirbetric. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Mirbetric. M Y R B E T R I Q. Yeah, but that's expensive. Um, I, first one I would recommend is Tamsulosin because, like as Lynn says, it's generic, and I use it. And it's cause I think it's like four dollars for a ninety days supply. Hey Rick, Rich Jackson. 
Oh, Rich Jackson. Hello, Rich Jackson. I wondered who had snuck on the call. Yes, please. Another one is uh, S A N C T U R A. And there's a generic for it. My Betrix. This is an earlier version of my Betrix. Oh, okay. So it's okay. less expensive. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. So do, do you, have you made a note of those, Les? Yes, I've been trying to anyway. Uh, what What is uh, Rapaflow? Anybody familiar with that? Anybody know Rapaflow? I've heard of it. Yes, Rapaflow is very similar to Tamsulosin. It's, uh, I took that years ago. Yeah, sim very similar. Okay. Now, I did take that for some time, and it didn't seem to do any good at all. So I just told the doctor, might as well quit. Okay. And it didn't change anything when I quit. Well, you know, maybe try this, this Centura or the Mibetric and see if you get any, um, if you get any benefit out of them. Okay, I'll uh, talk to the doctor about it. Yeah, I mean, as we say, the Mibetric is is expensive, but um, Rich Jackson suggests this other one, Centura, and that might be that might be a um, a good alternative. So, okay. um, so yeah, and, and be in touch with us if you need more help on that. Okay, I tried to jot down the names. If I misspelled them or something, I may have to get back with you and get the spell correct spelling. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, any anything else for Les from anybody before we move on to Carl for the um, for the balance of our time? Okay. Um, Carl. Hello. <laughs> yes. You 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 have. Uh, you have the balance of the time. Actually, not because there's one thing I want to mention. So leave me five minutes, please. Oh, okay. I I, I usually talk fast, but um, I went to, on a visit today to my dispensary. I live in New Jersey, and uh, I recently got a special card issued by the state of New Jersey that allows me access to medical marijuana products. I started using it about a month ago. I have never, nor do I ever intend to smoke anything. So uh, they offered an edible product, and the edible product is in the shape of a pill, and it tastes like a mint. So each of those mints are rated at five milligrams of THC. They told me to start with one, and then if that I wasn't feeling any effects, I should increase it. So I take it before bedtime because it's called a nighttime formula and it's supposed to help me sleep through through the night. Uh, one didn't do very much, and then I went up to two, and the two didn't seem to do very much, but I didn't want to go beyond that until I visited the dispensary today. So uh, they said that, of course, it depends on the individual as to what the uh, therapeutic dosage would be for me specifically. Uh, they also said they have a, they had a newer product of the mint, as they call it, and there's a daytime version. And so the daytime version doesn't make you drowsy, but it let, supposedly makes you less anxious. That's also at a 5 milligram dosage of THC per mint. And uh, I took two of those after I purchased it. And by the way, there was 70 in a, in a package, and that package cost me $51. So uh, just to give you some background. So my, my question to the group of anyone who's had experience or is familiar with <clears throat> THC dosages and um, what, what I should be, lack of a better word, playing around with to determine something that will really be effective for me because I haven't found that at this point. And what is it exactly that you're looking for the drug to do? Uh, relieve anxiety. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Anybody have any input? Anybody, anybody using medical marijuana? Anyone else on the call using medical marijuana? I, I was using it for uh, sleep, but not for anxiety. Uh, and it, uh, it was actually a drug that was uh, low in THC and higher in um, CBD. So I can't really comment. Um, I'm not sure what the THC dose would be to help you sleep. But the, the guys, you know, follow the advice of the pharmacist at the dispensary. That's your best guide. They know better than, even than any doctors. Uh, uh, ba basically, they said uh, that I can go up to 40 milligrams of THC, if not higher, but uh, those levels kind of scam me. Yeah, <laughs> the, well, dosage, the dosage should be around 20 milligrams. So it would be four of their pills. You know, and if you take that for a week, you'll find out not only at night, but you can do it during, you know, I don't know if I, I would just take, take four per day and do it every day for a week and see if it kind of calms you down. Don't necessarily use it for sleep though. I mean, there is, I mean, if it's, if it's a higher, you know, amount of THC, there's a couple of different, you know, blends of marijuana that then they work differently. Um, but, and I'm not sure which one you're getting from that place you're going, which, which strain you're getting, you know, and five milligrams, what, what else is in the pill? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> but I would, I would try, I would try 20. So four pills, just my thoughts. Okay. And, and anyone else, can anyone else contribute from, from, either experience or knowledge of other people? Uh, this is Bob Bordiga. Um, yes. I, uh, I just started taking the uh, CBD uh, care by design that somebody mentioned on the last week's call to help with hot flashes. Uh, I'm not sure if it's working or not, but it has okay. 18 to 1 and just a small amount of THC, but I, I really don't see it, it doing much. But for sleeping, uh, what works for me is Tylenol PM. That helps me sleep. Okay. Okay. Um, good. Any, any, uh, anyone else? Well, it sounds like what about twenty milligrams might be a um, might be a dose, and maybe taking that through the day is the experience that. Um, that Ken's had, and 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 so you could try that based on his experience. And right, you know, right, and and also I'm on sertraline with 50 milligrams, which I believe is is a low dose. So I take that once a day. Sertraline is that that's an anti-anxiety. Yes. Okay, and yes. and did you mention that to the pharmacist so that yes. they know? Okay, and they still say you can go up to 40 a day. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean that you know the, that that that's the, the 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 medical advice is up to 40 a day. Your concern is is 40 too much. Ken, um, from experience, is talking about 20. So um, try 20 and. You know, as Ken said, he, you know, it may be, it, it's worked during the day as well as just at, just at night. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have you tried melatonin, Carl? G generic? Uh, I did in the past and I got nothing out of it. Maybe about two, three years ago I tried it, but no, nothing helpful with that. I just well, that's like, for sleep. I, I thought your issue was anxiety. Yes, well, I mean, to help me sleep, but also, also part of the uh, what wakes me up uh, during the night is that I've got some mu muscle pain uh, that I've been trying to control. I am having physical therapy twice a week, and um, 
it, it's almost like clockwork between two and three in the morning. I get up with, with pain in my leg. I, I go back to sleep pretty quickly thereafter. But the uh, medical marijuana products is supposed to help with uh, alleviating pain as well, from what I've been told. Yeah. It's not doing a very good job for me. <laughs> I've heard it's, um, it's useful if, you ha if you're taking opiates that uh, THC will enable you to lower the dose of uh, opiates that you're taking and still get the same pain relief. But, uh, but um, THC alone, I don't believe I've heard that that is useful for pain reduction. Right. No, well, I, can, I can honestly tell you, Lynn, it is. <laughs> it is? Oh, okay. There, there's the, the chief head expert right there. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. But honestly, no, at, right at, at five milligrams, you're not going to feel anything. It's, it's barely, an, it's, you're not going to feel anything with five milligrams. Probably not even 15. 20 is kind of on the low end, you know. So I, I would, and again, you're probably, it's going to take, if you take 20 milligrams, take it for seven days and see the difference. But I wouldn't say it's, it's not going to be used at that dosage even to put you to sleep. So it's not like a sleep aid. It's just for anxiety, you know, and, and it helps with pain. No question. I'm not sure at 20 milligrams though. You, know, <clears throat> you have to be a little round up or in the couch to have it help for the pain, but it does help. So anyway. Thank you. Point of clarification, sertraline is an antidepressant, not, not anti-anxiety. It is. It does affect the uh, serotonin uptake, which can cause anxiety, but it's mainly an antidepressant. And there was also another medication that my uh, oncologist had given me for pain, but I take it very sparingly, and that's tramadol, which is a type of an opioid, but I use that, I have used it very sparingly, maybe once or twice a month, uh, one pill. So I'm, I'm a bit nervous getting, for lack of a better word, hooked on that medication. All right. What's the scoop on tramadol, Len? Well, yeah, as Carl said, it's a kind of a maybe one of the lowest, uh, po least potent opiates or opiate derivatives available for pain relief. Okay. It probably has a pretty low addiction potential, extremely low, I'd say. Okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I want to just talk about a couple of little things. Um, one is, and I know um, we try to work through the, um, the teething issues around our forum, um, but last week I actually posted the chat window into the forum, and I'm going to post this week's into the forum again. And that's particularly helpful for any of you who are on the telephone and you cannot see what is being written into the chat window. Um, and uh, I think some of our issues with the forum were related to some confusion over usernames and um, passwords because we were all, most, most of the ANCAM folk um, we're already enrolled and we weren't sure exactly what our password, our username was, but if you're a new user to the forum, you'll be asked to sign up to the forum and it should be fairly easy. So if you're using the telephone um, and um, or if you're listening to this in a re in a uh, on the replay, um, Try and log into the forum and you'll choose the prostate cancer forum and you should see the chat window for this week um, after we've posted the, uh, the, the, the um, recording. Um, and, and you can use that forum, that prostate cancer forum for pretty much anything you want. So if you've got a question you want to ask everybody else who's on the call, you can use it. I mean, we're not trying to supplant Inspire here. 
but what we are trying to do is allow those of you who are regular participants or even not so regular participants to communicate with each other directly through the forum. Um, and um, yeah, so th that um, that is the the the, the issue. We, we we don't want. We, we've talked about it, making it just completely open, so anybody can just post. But we we feel that there should be some um, uh, there should be some level of security and privacy. So we're asking people to sign in. At least we can see who's using the forum. Um, and it may take several months before we get up and running to the point where we like it. There could be other groups that will be using it more regularly, like the MS people or maybe even the sarcoidosis people. Um, but the but we, we, we have it and it's available. Um, the other right. thing I wanted to ask Len about, because it came up, um, earlier in today's call when Peter was talking about his records is wh where do we stand with Citizen and can we push Citizen out to everybody all the ANCAN users? Actually yeah I believe we can. Um, <clears throat> if for those who aren't familiar with it Citizen uh, for at, at no cost to you uh, will uh, require well, of course, you'd have to tell them where your medical records are kept at different institutions, and you either provide them to Citizen yourself or uh, you just give them your institution name and they'll request the your medical records from the institution. So basically what you have is Citizen is a repository for uh, all of your medical records from all the different uh, providers that you've used. And um, that could be useful if everything's in one place. So if, uh, if you go for a second opinion or you switch oncologists uh, and you, he'd like to see all of your previous records, rather than contact all the previous institutions you've gone to, previous providers, you can just tell um, Citizen to send all of your medical records or you could specify which ones uh, to a certain doctor or, or provider. Uh, and again, it's no cost to you. Um, so far, they've been uh, successful in uh, pulling together all of my medical records from all of my uh, providers. And, uh, you know, it's kind of anytime you want to check your own medical records, if you haven't been tracking them meticulously yourself, just go to Citizen and you can download anything you want on your own medical records or just take a look, just view it. Um, I've only run into one issue where I went to uh, Mount Sinai <clears throat> for a second opinion from um, Dr. Zalewski, who is a radiation oncologist at, did I say Mount Sinai? It's, uh, at MSK. Um, and uh, I said, you know, I had my phone with me. I said, he, he said, I, I I'd like to see the uh, the images of uh, the NIH scan that you had done. So I showed it to him on my phone from Citizen, and he said, no, nah, I said, I, I really would prefer to see the actual disk so we can put it in our system. And uh, so, you know, other than that, I, there, there haven't been any issues or problems with uh, Citizen. So Len, as you can hear, has been our Ankan guinea pig. And um, I will work with Len over the next couple of weeks and we'll figure out a way to um, uh, write up what we need to write up to get it out to you. We'll be in touch with um, Stacey Tinyanov, who is um, a patient advocate in her own right and a very, very good one. And she recently started working with Citizen um and we'll we'll get some lingo we'll put it all together and we'll we'll do a a big mailing to all the prostate cancer folks and invite you to um to participate but i'll i'll work with len um 
as Len's time is available because he's a he's a man who's moving around the country right now and uh, so we you know I'm a man yeah. of leisure I've got time for you Rick anytime <laughs> okay all right guys um look at that 59 minutes past the hour we're bang on time Anything else anybody wants to raise quickly that we might have overlooked or anybody we might have overlooked? Mr. Jackson, you, you came on late. Is there anything you else you'd like to talk to us about? Oh, how about a plug for uh, Speaking Freely? Uh, speaking Freely is always welcoming to anyone that cares to stop by. Third Thursday of the month, uh, 8 p.m., Earlier this evening, I was at my radiologist's monthly cancer support group. They're working with a genetic testing firm called Invite. Yep. I N I N V I T A E. They're offering free genetic testing for up to for forty-seven. Uh, genes 27 variables i've got the brochure they handed out what their intent is is to basically compile non-identifiable statistics and be able to have a for example a drug company contact them to say how many men had this particular uh result and then they can they can in turn say we had seven in this area if there was interest in the drug company for perhaps a trial in vitae would contact the doctor's office which would have the identifying characteristics for us and then the doctor's office would contact us mm -hmm. if you have a positive on certain of the uh, genes that they're looking for <clears throat> your male heirs, your male first line blood relatives can be tested for it for free. That could be something worth looking into a bit further. Okay, so this, this is germ, I'm, I'm assuming this is germline or uh, is they it? They take a wet, a wet sample. It's, it's so a wet biopsy. Saliva. It's saliva. Okay, so if it's coming from saliva, it's it it is um, looking for inherited. It's looking for inherited mutations. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for letting us know about that. And um, maybe we could get you. Maybe we could get Mr. Jackson to write up a little blog post on that. You can always hope. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, we can always ask Mr. Jackson. He can always say no, but if we don't ask him, we don't give him the opportunity to say no. If you don't ask, the answer is always no, but it's typically okay. better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> well, I see. Okay. Now, let me ask Mr. Jackson. Did he avail himself of a free meal at either Applebee's or uh, Denny's yesterday? He did not. Mr. Jackson no. does not do lines. <laughs> does not do what? I do not do lines. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah. I thought well, you, you you could do you you're a veteran you were you were entitled weren't you? That is that's a correct statement. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> we're not going in. I don't. Room. I don't do. I don't do lines. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. Well, we thank you for your service and we thank any other veterans that are on this call for your service too. And um, hope that you had a, a good Veterans Day. It was. Okay. 
All right, I think that's about it. Next call is going to be uh, next Monday, the 18th. Uh, I actually will be in Northeast Vermont. Um, and I will hopefully be able to take the call from there. Um, if for any reason I can't, then one of my capable assistants, co-moderators, excuse me, will be, uh, will, will readily step in. Okay. I'll say, I'll say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well done, Rick. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.